Yeah, if I was in high school. All right. Hello, everyone. We all look a little bit shell-shocked. We all look just a little bit shell-shocked. Last week, I think, was rough. Yeah. Uh, that was iteration one? Yes? OK, yeah. Um, this course is nearly done. We're nearly finished. We're nearly finished operating systems. Yes, two big thumbs up. Yes, great. Um, today, we're going to spend not actually that much time talking about virtual memory. We're not going to spend that much time talking about virtual memory. I want to finish what I started last week. And uh, that is going to be, can we handle seg faults? Can we handle seg faults? And then quickly uh, spend a little bit of time just going through all of those different things. Like, what are each of these different parts of my system doing when the segmentation fault shows up on my screen? What's actually happening under all that? And then be a little bit, I don't know, when I, when I learned all this stuff, I was just a little bit elated. Like, now I actually know what's going on there. I know what that means. I know what segmentation fault means. I'm still really angry when I see it, but I know what it means. I know what it means. Let's try to get to that point. Let's try to decide if we can or cannot handle seg faults and what are the side effects of that. And then I want to spend some time going through my lab three and then talking about assignment three uh, just generally. Um, and then if we get back to virtual memory again, fine. If not, no problem. Um, and then just to preview for the week, uh, tomorrow my plan is to talk about the final exam. I don't think that the room has been scheduled yet. I don't think it's been scheduled yet. I'm told that it will be scheduled soon, but I don't think it's actually been scheduled yet. But like I said, I'll, I'll try to let you know when I know. Um, and then with the rest of the week, we will try to run out uh, virtual memory and paging um, with the time that we've got left. So uh, by the end of today's lecture, what I'm really looking for you to be able to do are to describe what happens in various parts of the system when a segmentation fault happens. We started this last week on Thursday, um, and we'll finish this up today. I want to spend time just giving a quick summary of each of these different parts of the system, what those different parts of the system are doing. And then we'll take a look at that code sample again that crashes and try to see what happens, try to see what we can do about it. Compare and contrast free space management and allocation policies. This is a if we get to it part. Uh, there's something that comes out of segmentation that we'll talk about. With base and bounds, we were able to allocate entire address spaces, and it's fixed in size. We have these fixed size chunks of physical memory. We just stick an entire virtual address space into there, and then we have this either this concept of either that block is free or it is not free which is kind of the same as file systems with blocks and clusters. They are either free or not free. They are allocated or not allocated, used or unused. With segmentation, though, we've switched to saying, let's allocate only as much as is necessary right now. And each of these things that we're allocating can be different sizes. And as a result of that, we've got to be able to keep track of what is allocated and what is not allocated. And that sometimes means how much space is allocated in this one chunk? And can I put anything in it if there's a request made for something to fit into there? So we'll take a look at some free space management and, uh, and allocation policies to try and, uh, to try and compare some of them, some of the approaches that are used there. They're all fairly straightforward to, to think about. All right, so let's get back into this idea of what's going on when we are seeing the words segmentation fault. We've got a program. We've got a program here that's called crash.c. Crash.c doesn't really do very much. It definitely doesn't do anything interesting. We've got this stack allocated string variable. It's a pointer to char. It's a stack allocated variable, and we've set it to be null. We print out the value of the string. It prints out null. We print out the address of the string. It's going to print out an address. It prints out something. Then we try to dereference it. When we try to dereference it, 
we get a segmentation fault. We're trying to access memory that's outside of the bounds of what we have allocated, what we have allocated. This one statement here, we're going to see this a little bit later, but this one statement, remember, is many assembly language instructions. We're pushing stuff onto the stack so that when we call the printf function in our standard library, it's got like the address of the string that we're trying to use. It's got the address of this static string or this hard-coded string in our code section, so it can, uh, in our data section, sorry, so that we can actually get this information printed out on the screen. We never get to these lines. We, we never ever get to these lines because before we get to that point, this act of trying to dereference something that is null is going to cause our code to sig fault. We're going to crash because we're trying to access something that's outside of what we have currently allocated. So between our heap segment, our stack segment, and our code segment, when we dereference that address, we're trying to access something that's outside the bounds of all of those different segments, so we're not able to actually access it. Just to prove to you that this crashes, I'm going to quit this. Oh no, I've entered a different mode here. I'm going to quit this exclamation point. I'm going to make it, and I'm going to run it, and it's going to crash. Our program does not print out the word segmentation fault. We proved that to ourselves last class by uh, uh, do it again. I'll just do it again. Let's open the program crash.c and search for the words segmentation fault. They are not in the source code. They are not there. We don't print it out. What is our program trying to do though? When this happens, when this happens, our program lldb crash b main r. When this happens, our program is trying to do something. It's trying to access memory that is outside the bounds of what we have available to us or what has been allocated to us. We're trying to access something that goes beyond the scope of where we are right now. The standard library, we took the time to clone this. We took the time to take a look at the source code repository for Muscle. And it has functions in it that have the words segmentation fault in them. So as an actual string, there are functions that we can call in the standard library and pass it a signal number. And it will print out, these are the words that correspond to that. But nothing within the standard library actually calls those methods themselves or calls those functions themselves. This is entirely somebody making the call to those functions that's not within the standard library itself. In terms of the responsibility or what the standard library is doing when segfault gets printed to the terminal, is nothing. It, the, the, the standard library is not doing anything at all when this is printed to the terminal. The shell is printing the word segmentation fault to the terminal. That is what is responsible for printing the words out, uh, segmentation fault to the terminal. I'm running uh, fish here, and this kind of gives you a uh, an idea of what's happening here because fish actually prints out this terminated by signal sig seg v address boundary error where uh, TCSH, which is what you're using on aviary, actually just prints out segmentation fault and then no other information, nothing else. Our shell is responsible for actually printing the words segmentation fault TCSH in this case. And what the shell is doing when this happens is just like your assignment one, this has forked, this has exact the program that we've asked it to run, and then it's waiting. And from the return code of wait, we can ask why did this program that we waited for terminate? Why did it terminate? And we can ask the question, did it get terminated because of a signal? And if so, what signal terminated it? What signal caused it to terminate? So the program, our program is trying to access memory that it hasn't been allocated. Our standard library is doing nothing at all. The shell is checking the return code of 
the process that it exec and waited on. So it's checking to see why that process terminated. The operating system is not printing out the word segmentation false. The hardware, I mean, I guess, yeah, technically the hardware is printing it out because it's literally showing up on your screen, but it's not causing those words to be printed out. The operating system and the hardware are kind of working together here in terms of printing out the word segmentation fault. The part of the OS starts like when you boot your system, when you start it up. This goes all the way back to week one's chapters. I think it's chapter four that this idea is described in, or chapter six. I, I forget which chapter it's described in, but as the system is coming up, it's setting a trap table. So our operating system starts to tell the hardware, these are the different addresses of code that you should start running in different events. So hardware interrupts are being fired, that timer is running and it's giving us the ability to switch back and forth between processes really quickly. But the other thing that the operating system is doing is saying, when there's a fault, so when a piece of code, when an instruction tries to access memory that goes outside the bounds of what it has been allocated, you should call this code. The hardware is dutifully taking all the instructions that are in my program and trying to run them. And it's going through the process of taking all of the virtual addresses that are in my program or in my process translating them to physical addresses, checking to see that they're within the bounds of what has been set for my process. And when I try to access something that's outside of the bounds of what, I've, what I have been allocated, the hardware then interrupts and the operating system takes over again. The operating system then says, okay, what was the cause of this this interrupt, this fault, what caused this to happen? Somebody tried to access memory outside the bounds of what they had been allocated. Who did that? It was this process right here. Okay, the operating system then says, I'm going to send a signal to this program. You just tried to access memory that was outside the bounds of what you had been allocated. The program then does what it's supposed to do by default. And what the program is supposed to do by default is uh, let me search for seg. Sig seg v, the default, this column is default, is to dump core and exit. And that's exactly what your program does. It dumps core and exits. The shell waiting on your process says, ah, oh, this bit unblocks. This program has ended. Why did it end? It was signaled. Did it end because of the signal? Yes. What signal caused it to end? Sig seg v. Print out the word segmentation fault. So our program is trying to access something that's outside its bounds. The standard library is not doing anything. It's not doing anything. The shell is waiting for my process to end. The operating system has set up this trap table. The hardware is translating virtual addresses to physical addresses. It checks to see that the physical addresses and virtual addresses are within the bounds of what the operating system has set for this process. It says, no, you just tried to access something that's outside your bounds. Operating system, please take over. The operating system takes over. It says, hey, who did that? You did that. Stop it. Sig seg v, your program then terminates because that's the default behavior of segmentation fault, sig seg v. Sig seg v with TCSH will print out segmentation faults. They're going to print out different messages, and uh, I'm not going to clone TCSH again. But when when I when I did clone TCSH, there was that MESGS and messages array, this giant array of structures. 
and for each of those messages, there was entries for one of these different signals that was causing that process to terminate. So they're not all going to print out segmentation fault, but they'll print out something. This is the reason why the process terminated if it was terminated by a signal. Uh, when, when I ran LLVB, you saw instructions here. Um, it's because I didn't compile this with a G flag. Yeah, so if I compile this with a G flag, if I can get out of BIM here, and then I'll touch uh, crash.c and then make, and then LLDB crash, and then B main, and then R, and then N, 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 and then N, we get sig sig B there. It's just because I didn't put the dash G in. How, however, it's an instruction that's causing the fault. It is not a statement in C that's causing the fault. Yeah. Any other questions about the role that each of these different parts is playing in seg fault showing up on your screen? Yeah. It's going to standard error. But again, it kind of depends on the shell. It's the shell's choice where it wants to print. It might print, like your code, if you did this in assignment one, your code might have printed to standard output because maybe you didn't know about standard error yet. TCSH, I believe, is printing to standard error. Fish, I believe, is printing to standard error. All right, okay, so quit, yes. Our program here, our process is receiving a signal and is handling a signal. Can, can, we, can we handle it then? There were, there were two signals that I said you cannot handle. Do you remember what they were? Kill? And stop. Okay, yeah, so kill and stop. Sig seg v is a signal. Okay, this is a quick thumbs up, thumbs down. Are we going to be able to do this? What do you think? Okay, more, more thumbs up, but that's only because some people have two thumbs up, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, more thumbs up than thumbs down. Let's, let's try. So let's take a look at crash.c again. We need to register a signal handler. So uh, I just happen to remember how to do most of this, so I'm not going to open up the man page. I'm going to include signal.h. Uh, my signal handler has to be uh, the signature is void, handle, seg fault, and it has to take an int. And then I'm going to print in here printf handling seg fault. period, backslash n, okay, and then I need to register the signal handler, so signal sig, sig v and handle sig fault, okay, does that look okay to everybody? Okay, I'm going to open up a new tab here, and I'm going to change to this lecture. I'm going to make it. I got to cast this to void. I'm going to make it again. Okay, so it compiles. I'm going to run it. I want you to predict the output here. What's actually going to happen? Just take 10 seconds. Okay, here are some options. And I'm gonna give you some more time to think about this, just a short time. The options that you've got are, we print out the words handling seg fault, and then we go down here to woo, that was a close one, and then exit successfully. That's the first option. 
The second option is we get to this line that tries to print out. Let me dereference that real quick. It never prints that out. It does print out handling seg fault, and then it exits. So it doesn't print anything else. It just terminates after that. So option one, we try to do this. We get sig seg v. We print this out. We then proceed with the next line, and then we exit successfully. Option two, we print out handling seg fault, and then just exit. We don't print it, finish the rest of the program. We just terminate. And then option three is we just keep printing out handling seg fault over and over and over again. Those are your three options. Let's take five seconds, and then I want you to hold up one, two, or three fingers. That's your guess? Pick one. Pick just one. Just pick one. OK. OK, what's everybody's guess? So one, two, or three. One, we print handling seg fault. We proceed and finish the program. Two, we print handling seg fault and immediately exit. Three, we just keep print handling seg fault over and over and over and over again. Everyone, just guess, just guess. OK. We ready? My fans are spinning up here. My fans are really spinning up here. Let's try this. So I'm going to pop this into my debugger here. I'm going to break on main. I'm also going to break on uh, handle sig fault. So I've got two breakpoints here, main and handle sig fault. I'm going to run. This line obviously is not going to seg fault. It's not going to terminate. So I'll step over that. This also doesn't terminate. That's fine. Let's step over that. This one we know will print out the string is null in parentheses. It does that. Here's a string null. We print out the address of the string. It prints out something that happens to be in our stack. So remember, those addresses are really big because they're at the bottom of the virtual address space. And now we're on line, line 19. I'm going to run line 19. And when I run line 19, we get this handle sig seg v invalid address. Fault address is 0x0. So it's trying to use 0x0. It's trying to use null as an address. I'm going to hit n again. And now we're handling that seg fault. So that line caused the seg fault to happen. The operating system has then, it's kind of like a second step of this is now the OS is sending us this signal because the hardware raised that interrupt to us or to the operating system. And now we're here, we're printing out handle seg fault. When our process handles a signal, we suspend execution of whatever we were doing before, just before we receive that signal and we start handling the signal. I print F, handling seg fault. I exit the signal handler. And then I go back to where I was before. And I'm going to try and rerun that instruction that caused that seg fault to happen. And then I'm going to go back to my signal handler, because my operating system is going to send me another signal. And then I'm going to print out, handling a seg fault. And then I'm going to go back to my code. And I'm going to try and run that same instruction again. And then I'm going to get a sig fault. And then I'm going to go back to my signal handler. And then I'm going to keep going back over and over and over and over again, ad infinitum. Here's some interesting stuff that you can kind of see that's going on here. We're getting this syscall that's happening. We had just finished uh, running the syscall after we did that um, because we're kind of like going in the state of handling a signal. Uh, so we had to, to suspend what we were doing right now and then go to the signal handler. But we just keep printing this out over and over and over again because we just keep going back to where we were before 
just before the exception was raised, just before the hardware interrupted the operating system to say, hey, there was a problem with this instruction. The stack pointer hasn't changed yet, or the instruction pointer hasn't changed yet. The program counter hasn't said, you successfully finished this instruction. So you just keep going back to that same instruction and trying to rerun it over and over and over and over again. So what do we do? What's the point of all that? Why do we even have the ability to register a signal handler for a segmentation fault? Why would we want to do that? All right, well, one reason is I am a human that can type out better error messages than segmentation fault. That's one reason why I might want to handle segmentation faults. That might be one reason why I do this. Another reason why I might want to do this is I can start to say, well, I'm going to try to handle this seg fault, and then I'm still going to exit, but I'm going to specify a custom exit code. I am going to tell the person running the program I've died because of this specific reason. I can also try to start doing things like, and this is kind of outside the scope of, of segmentation faults themselves, but I can start to do things like on line percent %d, and I can start to use these special variables here. So line is a special variable that says this is the line number of code that this, uh, that this, that this variable is on. This is the line that this variable is on. And it's never going to print that message out, so I'll put it up here. And we can get a sense of what has successfully finished, because we'll be able to see those messages. So I'll make this, and I'll run it. And we can see here that on line 20, we get, here's the address of that string. And then I can print out better error messages than segmentation fault. But for the most part, you really don't want to catch or handle seg faults. You just kind of want to let it crash. You just want to let it crash and whip open your debugger and try to figure out why you got into that state. Why did you get into the state of getting a segmentation fault? All right, so here, whirlwind tour, whirlwind summary. Your program trying to run an instruction that causes a fault. You're trying to dereference something. You're trying to use an address a virtual address that when translated to a physical address is outside the bounds of what you have been allocated. The standard library, not doing anything. The shell is waiting for your process to finish so that it can inspect the return code or it can inspect the, the result of calling wait to see why your process terminated and ask questions about whether or not it was a signal that caused it to terminate. Our operating system sets up that trap table and then handles the interrupt that is fired by the hardware the hardware is translating these phys uh, tr virtual addresses to physical addresses and checking to see if they're in the bounds of allocated space. The operating system receives the interrupt and then tells your program to stop doing that by sending it a signal. Your program then exits. The shell prints out seg faults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a fair question. Would it be possible to print out handling a seg fault and then force it to go to the next line of output? One, one thing I'm going to say is that's a good question, but it's a terrible idea. <laughs> because if the line before caused a seg fault, then what are you supposed to do about the results of that? Like you're, you're probably trying to calculate an address to use it for something later. Um, but if you can get to the point of changing things like your program counter, sure, 
you could then say, well, the reason that I'm here or the value that I was at just before that is this. I'm going to change my program counter to be the next instruction, not the next statement, but the next instruction. So just after the seg fault would have happened. You will probably immediately seg fault, though, because that instruction is also going to have virtual addresses that are outside the bounds of what you were trying to do. Yeah. So it, it's a good question, but a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you have a question or comments? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good question. I'm going to go back to my debugger and I'm going to run this and I'm just going to, I'm going to say B main and B handle seg fault. I'm going to run it and I'm going to just continue so that I get the crash to happen. I'm going to hit next, next, next. Oh, I got to delete the exit from here to get that to happen again. So I'm going to comment this out. Make B main handle seg fault R C N N N. Okay. So we're going into this um, assembly language stuff, and this is actually in the standard library. So there's stuff that's happening in the standard library and re related to signals specifically, but not really anything to do with segmentation fault. We don't have the source code for the standard library in my debugger here, so we don't see what it's doing. We just see the instructions that it's been compiled down to. So that libc.so.6, um, that's one of those files that's getting mapped into our address space, and that's the standard library, and it's dealing with signal handling there. Yeah. All right. OK. So yes, the answer is yeah, sure, we can handle it, but there's not much we can do about it because we can't really change the state of what our program's in. Let's take a look at lab three. Let's take a look at lab three. So in lab three, uh, you were taking a, an initial look at um, EX fat formatted volumes. And you're really specifically trying to do file system checking on them. So you've got an image that may have been uh, corrupted in some way. The data structures in the file system are inconsistent with each other. So try to print out some of those inconsistencies in the file system that you've got. I'm going to take a look at some of the code that I wrote for this. Uh, so this is my solution. As with all the other labs, I'm not going to publish this file on the course web page. It's streaming on YouTube, so you can see it there, but I'm not going to publish this file um, by itself. I'm going to take a look at, uh, at the structures that I've got before I get into the code, because the structures that I've got kind of tell me how to write some of the code that I'm writing. Um, the first thing that I have that is kind of relevant, I'm going to scroll down here, is the main boot sector struct that I gave to you. This was in the lab. This is in the assignment. This is just available and free for you to use. The only thing that I've done here that's different than what I gave to you was I put right alongside each of these fields what their valid values are or what their valid bounds are supposed to be. This is like my personal style. This is something that I'll do personally. I know that this field is supposed to have these values, so I'm just going to put that define as close as possible. And as long as I'm using those values after the define has happened, like it's just going to work. It'll be fine. Uh, so that's the main difference between this structure that I have here and the structure that you have in the lab document itself. But that's not as interesting as this structure that I've got up here. So this is everything on one screen. Uh, I've got two main structures. 
I've got a directory entry structure. And in this case, I have just an allocation bitmap structure. The allocation bitmap for the lab was the only directory entry that I cared about. I did not care about any of the other kinds of directory entries. When you are working on the assignment, you'll care at least about three other kinds of directory entries, four in total, but at least three other kinds of directory entries. So you'll probably want to approach this. You may want to approach it. And again, to be clear, you don't have to do it this way. This is just how I'm doing it. You don't have to do it this way. This allocation bitmap structure is 31 bytes in size. It has exactly 31 bytes. So bitmap flags reserved first cluster and data length, the size of those stitched together is exactly 31 bytes. These are just the fields from the table for that directory entry. So I haven't really done anything creative here. It's just taken what's defined in the, the, uh, the table for this uh, directory entry and dumping it into a structure. The, the creative thing, the creative thing that I did, and I'm putting air quotes around that, the creative thing that I did here was use a union inside of a struct. I don't know who you took 2160 with. I don't know if you did unions in that class, but the kind of canonical place to use unions is just like, here's a bunch of shapes, here's a bunch of shapes, and here's how you do OO and C. This is a practical use for unions. Every directory entry type starts with entry type and it's one byte. If you look through all 16 or whatever of those different entries types that there are, those directory entries, they all start with an entry type that is exactly one byte in size. Everything after that, some of them are similar, some of them are not similar, but they're all 31 bytes after that. Every directory entry is a complete pack of 32 bytes in total. Unions, to remind you of what a union is here, a union is a way for you to, to declare like, it's gonna be one of these things and it's gonna pack all of that space into the widest type, but all of them are 31 bytes. If you're using this approach and you make all these directory entry types, they're all 31 bytes. So they'll all fit into the same amount of space. And then once you're going through the process of reading into a directory entry, you don't have to go through the process of checking, is this this type, read into this thing. Is it this type, read into this thing. Is it this type, read into this thing. You just blindly read into a directory entry. And then once you've read it, then you can check the type and decide what to do based on that. So let's go down there. I am completely going to skip check boot sector unless anybody has any questions, which would be totally fair, but it's not that interesting of a function. The one thing that is interesting is, um, checking the, the max volume size, which is kind of interesting. I didn't even bother checking the max volume size because you can't represent something bigger than 64 bits in a 64-bit field. So you can't make something that's bigger than 2 to the 64 minus 1 in there. So I, I didn't check that. The thing that is interesting to take a look at, though, is the check allocation bitmap um, function. So I'll go to main. In main, all I'm doing here is reading the first sector bytes into a sector, into my boot sector, and that's it. And then calling those functions by passing that object. In check allocation bitmap, this is the function where I'm actually going to start navigating around my uh, file system. One of the first things that I'm doing is calculating how many bytes per cluster there are. So rather than going through the process of constantly recalculating this sector, uh, bytes per sector shift and cluster, sectors per cluster shift, multiplying them together, rather than doing that over and over again, just do this once, calculate it one time. It's always going to be that. It's never going to be anything different once you calculate it. So I calculate it once. And then the other thing I'm doing here is calculating where the start of the cluster heap is. I'm not using the fat in this. I'm not using the fat at all because I've said and I've guaranteed for this lab that your cluster, uh, the bitmap size was fits into one cluster. So you don't have to build a chain. You don't have to build a cluster chain. You just go directly to the cluster. You can build a cluster chain if you want to, but it will be one cluster long. So it's not much of a list. It's just going to be one cluster long. 
For the assignment, that's not a guarantee. The allocation bitmap may be several clusters long, so you may have to build a cluster chain for that. But I'm just going directly to the heap uh, offset. So I calculate where this heap starts, and I seek to just the start of the cluster heap. My strategy for working with this, uh, like go to the beginning of something and then seek to an offset within that, that's my approach to do this. Seek set, when you're seeking, says from the beginning of the file, seek to this location. Seek cur says from where you are right now, seek this many more bytes. So my first step is seek to the beginning of the cluster heap. And then once I'm at the cluster heap, seek to the first direct, first cluster of the root directory. So just go straight to the first cluster of the root directory. I'm doing that off by two arithmetic because there are no sector zero and one. So I just have to, to do that. We okay with this so far? Okay. Once I'm at the root directory, this is again an interesting part. I'm at a directory. The root directory is a directory. It's a directory. And so I can just immediately start reading from the cluster heap into directory entries. I, I don't have to check to see if they are directory entries. But by, by being at the first cluster of the root directory, I'm in a directory, just start reading directory entries. With the struct that I've got, this D entry, it's, it's that one byte and then a union. I don't have to check to see what it is. I just keep reading directory entries out of this thing. And then in this case, I'm stopping when I get to, it's a bitmap. It's the allocation bitmap. This is 0x81. Once I get to that, then I'll stop reading these uh, directory entries. And then once I have done that, I can just start treating this directory entry, so current entry, I can immediately start treating it as a bitmap. Your code, if you're gonna follow this approach, you're gonna to need to do a bunch of conditional checks at that point. Like if I need to make sure that I'm reading through uh, an entry set for a file. So I need to make sure that the first one is a file and then a stream extension, and then file name, file name, file name, file name. In this case, I'm just looking for that allocation bitmap, so I don't even bother checking. I know that it is an allocation bitmap by the time I get there based on the type that it was, because I've been kept constantly checking to see what the type is, so I'm going to interpret it as a bitmap. When you put other entries in your union, then you can use other entry names there, and then just start using those properties from within that union to interpret the bytes that are within that um, thing. At this point, now I'm ready to start going to where the, the allocation bitmap actually is. So go back to the start of the cluster heap. Don't, don't bother trying to find some other location. Just go immediately back to the beginning of the cluster heap. And then again, seek directly to the first cluster. It fits within exactly one cluster. I don't need to build a cluster chain for this using the seek set and then seek cur approach. And then after that, I'm going to start reading the cluster heap itself. And what I'm doing here is in this line right here, first I've allocated this many um, bytes for the bitmap. So I've figured out how many bytes there were in the bitmap based on the data length field from the directory entry. Here I'm reading that many bytes. I can't read that many bits. There's going to be less than a power of eight, less than a power of eight or a multiple of eight bits because we're going to have entries in our bitmap per cluster that's in the file system and not just that many bytes but i have to read that many bytes in this case i'm also not like cutting off those extra bits at the end yeah yeah no it's no problem i, I actually didn't stop to talk about it so thank you for asking the question Bitmap here is just uint at. It's just eight. It's a one byte pointer to eight bits. Pointer to eight bits, and then I'm just treating that thing in the file system as an array of of bytes. Yeah. So read into it, and then I'm just going to go through and do built-in pop count on those bits. I'm not truncating those remaining few bits. I think there's four bits at the end of this that don't actually map to clusters. 
So there's 24, 22 clusters. It's two. It's only two. It's 24, 22 clusters, and there's 24, 24 bytes. So there's two bits that don't map to anything. But when this is set, uh, when the makefs.exfat runs, it zeroes out the whole allocation structure clusters. So we don't have to worry too much about that. So this is counting the number of bits that are set. It's counting the number of clusters that are used. And then I'm subtracting from that um, total size to calculate that. Yeah. The data, the data length. The data length of the allocation bitmap says how many bytes the allocation bitmap is. Just bytes. So that means that the allocation bitmap doesn't necessarily take up a whole cluster, and it doesn't in this case. The data length is how many bytes it takes. But the allocation bitmap, because it's a bitmap, we've got one bit per cluster in the file system. So there's extra stuff at the end that doesn't actually map up to anything. That's why we're using the cluster count as the denominator there instead of the data length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, good. Any other questions? Y minus two. So in um, in ex fat, the first two clusters in the cluster heap don't exist. There is there is no cluster zero. There is no cluster one. So the the in in terms of thinking of zero based arrays, the zeroth entry in the cluster heap is this is the one that has number two, index two. And if we take a look at uh, the ex fat documentation. If we take a look at the documentation and we go to the data region here, it says in the smallest font possible, importantly, the first sector of the cluster heap has index two, which directly corresponds to fat entry two. And then there is no cluster zero. There is no cluster one. It's just cluster two. <laughs> that's the first one that's in the cluster heap. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So the denominator in this is the cluster count. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here to where it actually prints that out. The denominator is the cluster count and not the data length, because the data length of the allocation bitmap might be, um, so let's say that we've got five clusters in our file system. The data length of that field has to be eight or one byte. It has to be one byte and not, uh, not five bits, because we can't represent five bits. <laughs> we're not counting it as bits, so we're reading in bytes. So it has to be um, the cluster count, because we're trying to count how many clusters are used and not used, and not how many bytes in the allocation bitmap are used or not used. So the denominator here is going to be it's this many clusters are, are used or not used. Whereas the number of bytes in the allocation bitmap would be some other number that doesn't really map to anything. Yes, it's the number of set bits. And the number of set bits is going to be these clusters have been used. Yeah, yeah. The data bitmap. Yes, it's exactly the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's an identical idea, yes, yeah. Yeah. So the allocation is it talking about how there could be like more than one cluster because of the Yes. So in in this lab, 
I guarantee that there's only one cluster for that allocation bitmap. Um, but for the file systems that you've got for the volumes that I've given you for the assignment, the they are much bigger. And especially in the one sector per cluster um, volume, the allocation bitmap is bigger than one cluster. So it will span across several different clusters. And to, 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 to resolve that, then you should build a cluster chain. You, you may be able to assume that all of the, the allocation bitmaps are right next to each other, like all the clusters are contiguous. You might be able to assume that, but it would be safer for you to build a cluster chain. One other small thing I'll point at here, uh, I was working on this at home on Friday. For the first time in a while, I opened this up and um, apparently on Mac, especially M1 Max versus uh, x86-64, like what's on Linux uh, upstairs, the format specifiers for a long, unsigned long are different. Like it's LLU for Mac OS with ARM and it's just LU for x86-64, even though they're both 64-bit values, you're all nodding your heads. Like you're, you're feeling very frustrated by that. Okay. I don't know if you found this, um, but I'm going to go back up to the top of my file. If you include this int types.h, uh, you can then start to use this notation that I've got here. Uh, let me find an example of it. You can use this notation here. So it's percent and then open quote and then put PRI U64, and that will just fill in the correct platform specific identifier so you don't have to constantly change it and then recompile it and change it and check to make sure that you're on the right system before you submit it. Yeah. What's that? Do everything on aviary. That's also fair. Some people are shaking their heads. <laughs> are you using VI on aviary? Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Um, if, you, if you're running on a Windows machine, uh, if you're using Windows subsystem for Linux, it's almost identical to aviary. It is almost identical to aviary. If you're running it on a Mac, if you set up some virtual machines, you can make it almost identical to aviary, but uh, yeah. It, is VS Code Server installed on Aviary? Oh, okay. You can just VS Code straight to Aviary. Is that what you're telling me? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kyle wrote that document. You're right. Yeah, Kyle wrote that document. Uh, here, I'll show you. Just in case. I know this is like last week and <laughs> maybe a little late for this, but. Uh, Kyle made this document on supplementary, so course resources supplementary. Here, this Kyle Kyle made this document, and it kind of says how to set up VS Code for working on Aviary, I guess. I don't know. Okay, I I don't use VS Code. I live in the past, and I use Vim. Yeah. Okay. This is a bit bit of a digression. Uh, are there any other questions about the, the lab itself and, and my code specifically here? Mm -hmm. I didn't use seal or floor at all. I just truncated. So I'm going to go down here to uh, my percent. And these are just both integers. So when I'm doing the division, it's just truncating, which is effectively the same as floor. Is just truncating the decimal points off of that. I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, okay. Then you. Then I guess you should use seal for that. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> If, if you are going to use math.h, yeah, so you have to put this uh, dash lm, so link in the math libraries, or um, there's the, I think it's ldlibes, or ldlibs is equal to dash lm, something like that. That'll get your make file to work correctly. One of the fields says to round up. 
in the main boot sector. All right. Okay. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our assignment. The assignment is kind of a ex direct extension of what you've just done in the lab. It is a very immediate and direct extension of what you have done in the lab, except you are now going to be expected to actually read the file system. So not just check the structures, but actually read the contents of the file system. This assignment is going to get you to just read the file system. You're not in any way expected to make changes to the file system. Reading the file system here is going to be listing the contents of what's on the file system. So recursively traversing all the directory structures and printing out the file names and directory names. And after that, actually getting files out of the file system. So reading from the file system, writing out to a regular file in the same directory as what you're in right now. The due date for this is on Thursday, June 15th. Well, I'll let you figure out the rest of that statement. It's uh, Thursday, June fifteenth, but I was sloppy and I forgot. I forgot, and it's not going to make it to graders until Monday. And the well, you shouldn't be taking twenty one fifty at the same time as this course. <laughs> The, the deadline has officially changed in the paperwork. The deadline is not officially enforced until the originally posted deadline. Let me say it that way, okay? Is that clear? Are we okay with that? Yes? Okay. The, the, post, the posted deadline has changed. The actual enforced deadline is what was originally posted. Okay, okay, okay. We are all on the same page now? Yes? Good, good. This is only assessing you on one learning outcome, which is uh, write code to read a file system. You are implicitly being assessed on a bunch of things here, like um, being able to describe the structure of a hard drive. You, you kind of have to get a sense of what these words sector mean in terms of blocks and clusters to be able to do a bunch of this stuff. You're also implicitly being assessed here on being able to describe a file system implementation, EXFAT in this case. You, you can't really do this assignment without being able to describe or at least visualize this mentally, what's going on. I'm gonna skip over all the submission requirements here, and I'm gonna go straight down to, uh, to Jordy. Uh, so this all comes from what we've been discussing extensively in class, and your new uh, document du jour, which is the EXFAT file system specification. I mentioned this before in class, FAT32 has a white paper that is published as a PDF and it is a bad white paper and I do not like it, it's not even one bit. The person that wrote it is just like writing down to people and I really hated reading it. This is a good document. I believe that this is a well-written document it's impersonal. It's not like telling you you're a bad person because you don't understand how this works. It's a good document and it describes everything comprehensively. Uh, I haven't changed this part since I um, changed the volume, so I'll, I'll verbally tell you this. There are three volumes now instead of just two volumes because I am bad at basic arithmetic and I published one that had eight sectors instead of four sectors. So now there's three volumes. There's one with one sector per cluster, there's one with four sectors per cluster, and one with eight sectors per cluster. And your code should work for all three of these, or really any number of clusters per sector, as long as it meets the criteria of what's set in the EXFAT documentation. So there's three volumes in total. All three volumes have exactly the same files on them. They were all prepared in exactly the same way. And if you take a look at the README, it describes how you can make your own volumes if you want to. Uh, if you're running on a Mac, you can download the volumes. And if you change the extension to DMG, I believe, if you change the extension to DMG, you can just double click it and it will mount and you can start interacting with it. Like you can add new files to the file system if you want. 
If you're running a Linux system, follow the guide that I put in the readme itself. If you're using Windows subsystem for Linux, which is the only way you should use Windows now, you can follow the instructions that I put in the document with your uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, these are test volumes that you can use with your code. You can also use the volumes that were provided for Lab 3 for testing, or you can just make your own volumes, or you can format a USB drive and try that uh, if you have root access on a Linux machine. The graders may not use those specific volumes for your work, um, but these should exercise all the different parts of what you're being expected to do for this. There are three commands that I'm expecting you to implement, and there are examples of each of these commands. The first one is info, which is uh, tell me a little bit about what the file system is in terms of its metadata. There's the list subcommand, which is list recursively the contents of this entire volume. So not just within this directory, but the whole thing. And then there's the get command, which is get a, excuse me, get a file out of this volume. The info command should print out the volume label, the serial number, the free space on the volume, and the cluster size. The cluster size in sectors and bytes, this is metadata that comes directly from the main boot sector. There's not a lot of work to do there. The volume serial number comes from the main boot sector. There's not a lot to do there. The volume label, this comes from directory entries in the root directory. So the volume label is not that ex fat space space space, but it's going to be whatever I called the volume. So when you mount it, it shows up as like, this is the name of the drive that you just plugged in. That's the volume label that we're looking for here. The three volumes that I've got all follow the pattern 3430A3 and then S something that says what number of sectors per cluster there are. This is a directory entry in the root directory. So you'll have to read entries from the root directory to find this volume label to be able to print it out. The free space in the volume, this is lab three. So take what you did in lab three, you'll have to extend it to build a cluster chain, but you can take what you did for lab three and, and use that wholesale for, for this part of the assignment. The volume label itself is not just a string, but it is a Unicode formatted string. And that means that there are 16 bits per character and not just eight bits per character. There's a link here that you can follow, and there is a function that I've given you. You are free to copy this if you want to. All this does is take a 16-bit character and truncate the top eight bits. The top eight bits for ASCII formatted characters are all zeros. They're all irrelevant. It's just the bottom eight bits that actually matter for ASCII formatted values, and I'll guarantee that all of the files and volume names and everything is just ASCII, so there's no extra special work. Dealing with wide characters in C is painful. It is awful. It's terrible. Please don't do it. If you're going to do anything with Unicode, use Python or something. Yeah, just use Python. Um, so yeah, the volume label is something that you'll get out of a directory entry. You can use this Unicode to ASCII function that I provided to you to translate that into an ASCII string and then print it out. And then the rest of the stuff comes from uh, the assignment, or from the lab, I'm sorry. We're okay with info before I move on? Okay. The list function, the list command is going to go through the process of taking the image that you supply. So this is going to be something like A3 image and you're gonna pass it the list command and its job is to go through and recursively print out the contents of the entire volume. The order that you print it out in is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If you wanna do a depth first search, go for it. If you wanna do breadth first, go for it. If you wanna print out directories as you see them, depth first, do it, fine. What I really care about is that you are printing out all of the files and all of the directories. That is what I care about. You can use special symbols if you want to print out fancy output. So these extended ASCII characters, if I scroll down a little bit here, you can get special symbols um, that show up in this table right here, this OEM extended ASCII that are like fancy looking pipes and stuff. If you're feeling ambitious, great, let me know and do it. 
but I really only care to see that you're using like spaces and tabs to say this is how deep this directory is nested. That's really all that's necessary for this, to show me the depth of the directories. Yeah. Do you need to print like a slash, a backslash at the top? So this, this is the root directory here. This is the root directory. This is a file. So if I open this up, this is D colon backslash. This would be in that directory right away. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because there's going to be, in the root directory, there will be all those meta entries, like volume name and allocation bitmap and stuff like that. But there's also going to be files and directories and stuff that you'll have to print out. Yeah. So yeah, you don't have to print out special characters. You don't have to make it look like tree. But just print out the depth. Make sure that you're showing me what the depth of these things are. The order is also, like I said, not important. We're going to be looking to make sure that you have listed all of the files, not so much about what the order of output is. OK, the get command, so that's the last one, is actually get a file out of the file system. This was an exercise that we did in class. I didn't bring those printouts with me, but this was an exercise we did in class of here's a path name, and here are the steps that I have to go through to get to the file that is uh, referred to by this. With this assignment, the assumption is that the beginning of the path is always the root directory. We're not going to start like somewhere in the middle of the file system. You're going to start from the root directory and work your way down. If it has a leading slash or if it doesn't have a leading slash, both of those should work. But the first part of this is always going to just be starting from the root directory. So in this case, what this says is there's a directory in the root directory called path. Within that, there's a directory called to. Within that, there's a file called file.txt. Your job should be to take this path and then write out a file in the same directory as what your program is located that is called this. So file.txt, naturewalk.mp4, 0001.txt, stuff.epub. I forget what those epubs were that I put in there. You're going to have to take that file name and just write it out into the current directory. Any questions about that? You OK with that? Yeah. So in this case, what you'll be doing is traversing your way through, so like reading directory structures and stuff to find path, then two. And then once you're at the cluster heap for file, you'll just read the contents of the clusters for this file and then write them out to a file. So you'll be doing read, and then you've opened for write a file, and you'll be writing those same bytes out to the file. I'll come to you in a second. Yeah. Can I show the example on the list? Yeah, yeah. You have the maybe you have the the output, right? Can you say output to show the stack? So, the, okay, that's a fair question. The contents of this, whoops. The contents of this are going to be, uh, so I'm going to take a look at the readme. The readme has all of the file names that are on here. So the folder, the file that's in ebooks secretgarden.epub is going to be what you get from downloading this file. The multi-cluster directory, this is one that's got like so many files in it that it spans clusters. So you have to build up a cluster chain for this directory. All of these files are just a file that contains like a single character or up to four characters, and it's just the number that is the name of the file. This one is a video that everybody should watch. That one's a video, and it's quite big. It's, I think, 16 megabytes or something, so it's going to take many clusters to, to get to that file. So in that case, just take a look at the readme. <laughs> just Sorry, just a second. There's a question up here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it should be the same extension, but just, just to, to be clear, you'll make the file name have the same extension, but there's no difference between you reading bytes for a text file or for an MP4 file because you're just reading bytes. You're just reading and writing bytes from the file system into that file. Yeah, send them. Yeah, so if you're calling copy on a file system, what you're doing for this assignment is effectively the same as copy and then paste, yeah. Except we're copying from whatever the path is that we've given to the current directory. Yeah, that's effectively the same operation. Move, no, because the move would do a cut operation. We'd be changing the file system, and we're not doing that for this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so at least one of the files that I put in there takes more than 15 characters. And in EXFAT, all of them are potentially long file names. So the limitation on EXFAT is that file names can be up to 255 characters in length. And that can be up to, I think, 17 directory entries for file name, which would be quite big, <laughs> which would be quite big, but uh, yeah you should support any number of characters for the file name. What's that? Up, up to 255 characters, whatever the maximum is for EXPAT. It's going to be millions of characters long, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, so some implementation notes. A bunch of this is stuff that we've seen. A bunch of this is stuff that's just suggestions that you don't have to follow if you don't want to, but it will help make things a little bit better. With the lab, you were not really moving around too much. You went to the start of the cluster heap once. You went somewhere else. You went back to the start of the cluster heap again. You went somewhere else. There wasn't a lot of moving around. In this one, there's a lot of moving around. You're going to be constantly moving from place to place in the cluster heap. One thing that I might suggest that you do is write a function that will just go to a specific cluster. So take all the seeks that you're doing and allow, you, allow yourself to pass yourself. Write a function that takes as input a cluster number and seeks to that cluster so that you can just say, seek to cluster 10, and it will go to cluster 10, and then you can start doing whatever you need to do. That can help simplify things as you're moving around. I would advise that you don't build an entire tree structure from the fat to begin with for the list function. Don't just like start building the whole thing up at the beginning, because that's going to be a giant tree. Uh, just do it in, in line. So read a directory entry, decide what to do. Whether you recurse or print, decide what to do based on what you're seeing as you're seeing it. And then go back to the fat when you need to go back to the fat. This is a note about the you know, this is a two-based array that's designed by a maniac. Um, directory entries. You can go through the process of building up all of the actual values for the directories entries if you want to. So every one of those directory entry types has like, these are the bits that are set for this specific type of directory entry. Uh, but this web page, and I'm looking at this with uh, uh, an ad blocker for what it's worth. I have no idea what this page looks like without an ad blocker. Take that for what it's worth. This page just tells you what those numbers are. This is so much easier than trying to calculate what those bits are supposed to be. Just, just take the numbers off this page. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want, can you sit, send me that by email or post it on the course forum? That would be helpful. Um, regardless, don't calculate those numbers by hand. Just take these numbers right here. They're already done for you. I wrote this in this term uh, because this is something that catches a lot of students off guard, which is that directory entries for a directory can span multiple clusters that are not right next to each other. A really common thing that you might see in these images is what appears to be an entry set for the beginning of one file here. And then coincidentally, there's another entry set in the next cluster that's not for this file, but it just kind of looks like you're in the middle of an entry set and now there's two file entries or there's two stream extensions or some, something like that. As you're going through the process of building up 
cluster chains. And as you're going through the process of reading these directory entries for a folder or for a directory, you should keep track of how many bytes you have read. Keep track of how many directory entries you've read. Because there's only so many directory entries that can fit into a cluster. And it's determined by the size of directory entries and the size of a cluster, how many bytes are in a cluster. Keep track of how many bytes you've read so you know when to switch to the next cluster in the chain uh, so that you're not just blindly reading into this next cluster, which happens to be something else that you're not expecting. The unit code in ASCII, again, is something you can just copy if you want to. Here's the boot sector. And then the binary files. You're very familiar with binary files now, so I, I won't read that out to you. The assessment here is going to basically be just five points each for info list and get. They are structured info list and get because they are in order of difficulty and in order of like dependencies. You can't do info. You can't do list until you do info. You can't do get until you do list. You can't break up a directory structure until you've been able to descend into the directory structure. Um, and then the criteria is kind of the same for each of those. And then submitting your assignment is the same as it always has been for everything that you've done so far this term. All right, that's me yelling at you about the assignment. We're already one and a half minutes after class is supposed to be over, and I got yelled at once for being here late. So I'm going to skip ahead here, and uh, I can answer questions about the assignment tomorrow if there are questions about the assignment. But I will also spend time talking about the term test, the term test, the final exam tomorrow. Uh, and that's it. So I hope that you.